بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله وسلم على رسوله الكريم وآله وصحبه ومن اتبعه إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله and Ramadan Mubarak جزاكم الله خير for spending your morning here with us inshallah our intention is to share with you some ahadith today and some language that would help you understand the Quran better. Again, we're dealing with the mutun al-talab al-tafsir, the, the classical texts that are expected of a mufassir to know. The text I'm reading from is tafsir al-nabawiyyu al-sari'ah al-thabitu. These are the clear narrations from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he blatantly explains a word or phrase from the Qur'an. So hadith number nine. And Ka'b ibn Ujra radiyallahu anhu qal waqafa alayya rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallama bil hudaybiyya. On the authority of Ka'b ibn Ujra, he said, the Prophet, the Messenger of Allah stopped in front of me, you know, on, on the day of Hudaybiyyah. And this is the day where they made a new treaty. And my hair, there was a lot of lice coming out of my hair. He says, Did are you being uh, bothered? Is that 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 bother you? All those. Lice is coming out of your head. قُلْتُ نَعَمْ I said yes. قَالَ فَحْلِقْ رَأْسَكْ So then he said, so then shave your head. Or he said, إِحْلِقْ Meaning just shave. قَالَ فِيَّ نَزَلَتْ هَذِهِ الْآيَةِ So it was regarding me that the following ayah was revealed. فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا عَوْ بِهِ آدَمْ مِنْ رَأْسِ إِلَىٰ آخِرِهِ He said, so whoever, فَمَنْ كَانَ So whoever is amongst you who is marid, sick, or he has an other, some type of bother something in his head. فَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ سُمْ ثَلَاثَةَ أَيَامِ So the Prophet then told me, pray, I'm sorry, fast, Three days. أو تصدق بفرق بين ستة. He said, or give sadaqa that can be split up between six. أو انسك بما تيسر. Or do something, some nusuk, some act of ibadah that is easy for you. And nusuk is an act of ibadah. So what we learned from this hadith, is that the ayah فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ بِهِ آدَمْ مِنْ رَأْسِهِ فَفِدْيَةٌ مِنْ سِيَامٍ أَوْ صَدَقَةٍ أَوْ نُسُقٍ This ayah was revealed on, about Ka'b ibn Ujra. It's also important to note that the Prophet Wasallam, nor did his Sahaba in general ever shave their head except for a religious reason like Hajj or Umrah or a medical reason. It was not from the adab of the men to shave their head for cosmetic reasons. This is part of the effemination of the modern day man and the domestication of the modern day man that he shaves his head and for, 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 for what is it, cosmetic reasons. The Sahaba used to see to have long hair was part of the ni'mah of Allah and part of rujula, part of manhood. And the Prophet's hair used to go at the shortest to his fat of his ear or it would hit his shoulders. And if it went longer than the shoulders, they would cut it in this way and they would braid their hair in this way. And they, in fact, used to see shaving the head was a type of way of humiliating a person so that whenever they took prisoners, all the prisoners they took at Badr, all the prisoners they took at Uhud, when that prisoner paid the ransom, they shaved his head before they let him go. 
ihanatan lahu, humiliating him. And this is why they would not let their slaves grow long hair. This was reserved for the free men. And this is still the policy of in the world. In the United States, at most of the prisons, all the state prisons, it is not allowed for people to grow long hair if they're a prisoner in the United States prisons, unless they're in federal prison, they have more rights. It has to be a thumb, and then it has to be shorter than a thumb in this regard. So we need to go back and understand the reason for cutting their hair, what the Sahaba did. Again, we claim that we follow the Salaf. We should follow the Salaf in what they did, how they did, for the reasons they did. As we constantly say, what made them great will make us great. And if we go back to what they were doing for the reasons they were doing it, it would benefit us. Okay. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. An Ibn Umar radiyallahu anhu qaal, qaal Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kullu muskirin khamrun. Muslim. On the authority of Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, he said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, everything that muskirin, that gets you drunk or high, is a type of khamar, meaning we're going to call it the term khamar. And every Muskirin, everything that gets you drunk or high, is haram. Akhrajuhu Muslim. And it is narrated by Imam, I'm sorry, not narrated, it is compiled by Imam Muslim. There's a very important hadith for us to understand where Allah is talking about khamar in the Quran. He's talking about those things that get you high or they get you drunk in this regard. Nowadays, there are modern medicines that have some of the same effect of causing the person to get drunk or go to sleep or are narcotics that are given to people that have similar effect. These are not haram when they're used for medicinal purposes, okay? When they are used for recreational purposes, these things become haram. It has to be clear. The usage is what's important here. And what I'm talking about is those codeine pills, pain pills. Okay? An Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu anna al-yahuda kanu idha hadat al-mar'atu fihim lam yu'akiluha وَلَمْ يُجَامِعُوهُنَّ فِي الْبُيُوتِ فَسَأَلَ أَصْحَابُ النَّبِيِّ صلى الله عليه وسلم عن النبي فأنزل الله تعالى ويسألونك عن المحيض قل هو أذى فاعتزل النساء في المحيض إلى آخر الآية فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم اصنعوا كل شيء إلا النكاح فبلغ اليهود ذلك فبلغ ذلك اليهود فقالوا ما يريد هذا الرجل أن يدعى من أمرنا شيئا إلا خالفنا فيه أخرجه مسلم. This hadith is compiled by Imam Muslim and it's a very impacting hadith in the culture of Islam, the deen of Islam. On the authority of Anas, and Anas was the personal servant of the Prophet Sallallahu He helped him in his home and in his private affairs. He said that a Jew, that the Jews, they used to, when a woman amongst them was on her hayb, meaning she was having her menses, her monthly cycle, they would not eat with her or from her. They still do that. I'm a Brooklyn kid, grew up around Jews. They do not eat the food that a woman who is mensing has cooked, nor from a pot that she's cooked from when she's on her menses, 
nor is she allowed to eat with them at the same table. And they would not have intercourse with them. They won't even sleep in the same bed with them. She can't touch anything in the house while she's on her menses. If she does, they consider that thing foul. It is now defiled by her because she touched it while she's on her menses. She has a small room that she has relegated to, and she has to stay in that room until she's finished her menses. And then she comes off of her, she cleans herself, then she can touch things again. If she touches anything while she's on her menses, she has defiled that thing and it goes in the room with her. So the companions of the Messenger of the Prophet, وسلم, they asked the Prophet about that. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the following ayah. And they're asking you about the mahib, about the menses. Tell them it is an annoyance. It is an adha. It is a type of an annoyance for the women. So then become a bachelor. Al right? Stay away from the woman. Do without the women. When she's on her menses. This is talking about having intercourse with her just intercourse about this the prophet sallallahu said it's not the prophet said do everything with them except sex nikah is a word that means like impregnating it means throwing seeds on it so when you do it flowers and you shake them that's called nikah Okay, so it's indicative, it's a kinayatin, it's a nickname for having intercourse, okay, vaginal and genital intercourse, okay, so you can do everything with your wife except have genital intercourse. So the, yeah, the, the Yahud heard about that and they replied. This man does not want to leave anything from our situation, from our way, except that he, he, he goes opposite. He opposes us in that fair. It's very important, and this is again narrated and um, compiled by Imam Muslim, that the Muslims understand the ramifications of this hadith. Because we have followed the Jews in some instances of the deen. And that is when you find Muslims saying that if a woman touches the mushaf while she's on her menses, this is haram. Where did you get that from? Are you saying then that the woman's hand, when she's on her menses, has the ability to make something unfile, I mean defile that thing, and it takes away from it? You need a hadith to say that. Anything that is haram, you have to have a clear, a clear hadith stating that. In fact, we have a hadith saying the opposite. The Jews, though, if her hands are making the mushaf foul, what is her hands doing to your food? Why is she still cooking for you if she's foul while she's on her menses? She can't touch the mushaf. Do you understand what I'm saying? You have to understand what you, those people are saying who say that. She can't touch that mushaf. How can she touch your food then? And those have some seamless, they're, they're, they're okay. They're saying the same thing that she's foul. Islam is saying she's not foul. Okay? You can hug her. You can kiss her. You can sleep in the same bed with her. In fact, we have Hadith the Prophet used to have, you know, play with his wives and, 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 and cuddle with them. And do every kiss them and do everything except lead everything leading up to having general sex and not have genital sex with them. We have another hadith where the Prophet وسلم, is having his head on Aisha's lap while she's on her menses. And what is he doing with his head on her lap? He's reciting Quran. This is the place where the menses is. If there was something foul for him not to do, he wouldn't have put his head there and recited Quran. We have another hadith where Aisha radiallahu anha is ordered by the Prophet to go into the masjid while she's on her menses to fetch something for the Prophet. And the Prophet says, tells her to do so. She says, I'm on my menses. He says, is the menses in your hands? It's not in your hands. 
directly to the issue. So we need to change our mentality, this, this misogynist mentality that men and women have been uh, taught from some old tradition from shaitan or as coming from the Yahud. Islam clarifies everything. The issue with women or her menses has nothing to do with her hands. It has to do with her private parts. The only thing that she is not allowed to do is have vaginal sex. Okay? And Allah knows best. Number 13, number 12. And Ibn Abbas in radiallahu anhu Al-Huma, on the authority of Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, Paul, he said, Ja'a Umaru radiyallahu anhu ila rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam faqal. Umar came to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, haliktu. He said, O messenger of Allah, I have destroyed myself. Qala wa ma ahlakaka. He said, what has destroyed you? He said, Hawaltu rahliya layla. He said, I flipped my ride around last night, meaning I had sex with my wife from behind. Okay, not stomach to stomach, but from behind. Islam clarifies everything. There is nothing that's off topic. We have to deal with these things in a mature way. So Allah's messenger is teaching us everything, the dunya, the deen, the ibadah, even how to have sex with our wives, how the woman is supposed to have their menses. So Omar saying, I had sex with my wife from behind. She, or they say doggy style. I had sex with my wife like this. He says it that way. So the messenger of Allah didn't say anything to me. He didn't give me any reply. He stayed silent. Alhamdulillah. Look at the da'wah. When we hear something, we're quick to talk about it. Okay? We're quick to speak or we're quick to negate what we hear other people speak about thinking they were talking without having some research. But here the messenger of Allah didn't reply. So we can learn from these things. One of the things we can learn, if you don't know, don't say nothing. Don't even breathe wildly. Just don't say nothing. You don't have to have a reply. And then Allah revealed inspired the messenger of Allah with the following ayah. He says, what could mean? Your women are your harf, your it means your agricultural land, your farmland. The word harf in Arabic, brings up the picture of the farm, the lines, the rows where you're putting your seed down in. The, the brown dirt where you're placing the thing in the rows, that's the hearth, not the whole farm, just that part, and not with anything grown on it yet. Harthukum is the place with the dirt and the lines are straight. He says, Nisa ukum harthulakum. The woman, your women are your heart, your agricultural land where you place your seeds. Fa, and it's for you. Fa tu harfakumu. So go to your heart. Seed your heart. And nash it to however, and whichever technique you want to use to plant your seed. As long as you're planting your seed. So the Prophet said, he says, He says, from the word, the word aqbala is an Arabic term. Okay. Aqbala means you face the person, literally. Qabala, that's what we say, min qabalu, in front of you. Okay. Qibla is in front of you. It's the same word. And it's one of the many words in the Quran. Aqbala. And it's different from the word ja'a. When we talk about furuq in the Quran, 
the words that Allah chooses to use over other words. The difference between ja'a wa aqbala. The word ja'a means to come. He came. He may have came sideways. He came. He sat down. He looked. He's different. That any direction he comes, he comes. Ja'a wa aqbala means he came facing me. Wa aqbala ba'duhum ala ba'd. Okay? Wa aqbala, they facing each other. Okay? So he says here, Aqbil. This is in fi'lun am. This is an aura. Do it face to face. Wa adbir and meaning or here. So There's another delil that the word wa can has, has multiple meanings. It means and or. Okay. Adbar meaning from her dubur, going from the backside. Wa taqil dubur and and fear the dubur. So he says adbir and then he says dubur. The same root word from yatadabbaru, right? It's the buttocks. You can do it from the backside. But have taqwa from the dubr, meaning the anus here. Okay? But don't go into the anus. Walhayda. And watch out from the hayda when she's on her menses. So what we learn clearly from this hadith, the two things that are haram in having sex is going into the woman's anus and going into the woman while she's on her hayda, when she's on her menses. And this narration is, is compiled by a tirmidhi. Alhamdulillah, Islam clarifies everything. The next hadith, number 13. قال قالت عائشة رضي الله عنهما إن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال هو كلام الرجل في بيته كلا والله وبلا والله أخرجه البخاري This is compiled by Bukhari so it has the highest level of authenticity it's on the authority of Ata and he's narrating from Aisha he's saying so Ata the Tabi'i is narrating from Aisha. So he's going to Aisha and seeking knowledge. So what we can learn from this hadith, again, just from the isnad of the men being allowed to go to women who have knowledge and learn from them. Okay? And this kills the idea that women don't have anything to contribute when it comes to knowledge. And it should encourage our women to learn and gather knowledge. The same criteria for men is the same criteria for women when it comes to having the status of shuyukha, being a scholar in that regard. And men should seek to get knowledge and women should seek to get knowledge from whoever they have access to. So Ata went to Aisha. And he got knowledge from her. And she taught him in wara il hijab. And she taught him from behind a curtain. And she told him, may Allah be pleased with her and her father. The Messenger of Allah, sallallahu, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said regarding al-lagwi bil yameen. This is a term used in the Quran. Lagwi. Allah doesn't hold us accountable for lagwi. It's from the word lugha. We have the same word lugha. Lugha means language. But lagwi means wasteful sounds. You see, so language comes from sounds, but lugha and lagwi from that same root means sounds that don't really mean nothing. So Allah we fil yameen, he said, the, she said, the messenger of Allah, Rabbi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, this is the speech a man has in his house when he's talking to his wife and his children and he's just talking. He doesn't really mean it that way. Okay. When he says, wallahi, never that. I swear by Allah, this, that, and the other thing. Okay. Of course, this is just normal speech that he is allowed to but check it out where is it in his home so this another thing we can take from this is that a man can relax in his home and play around and joke around and and lower you know be very very playful in the confines of his house he's safe even to say some things that that outside of home he shouldn't say and he'll be held accountable for if he said the same type of thing, if he was that lax outside of his home. And so his family shouldn't hold him to that same criteria inside the home. Because we hear sometimes, oh, in the home he's like this. He can be laid back at home. Where else can he kick back and, and be a little bit more relaxed? At home. 
So we learn what to do. The, the type, as Ali said, fi kulli maqam maqam. Every particular place has its own particular type of speech, right? The house is a place for relaxed type of speech. And that even Allah doesn't hold us so much for in the home that he does outside of the home. Alhamdulillah. Number 14. And Abi Razin قال رجل يا رسول الله أسمع الله يقول الطلاق مرتان فأين الثلاثة أين الثالثة قال التصريح بإحسان أخرجه أبو داود and Abu Dawood's sunan is different than Bukhari and Muslim and Astaghfirullah and Nisa'is so Abu Dawood's book is for the people. Tirmidhi is for the scholars, the fuqaha. Okay? And Nasa'i is for the governor. Abu Dawood is for the people. The sunan. If you want to study what the layman should know, study the sunan of Abu Dawood. You want to study what the fuqaha should know? Study at Tirmidhi. Okay? You want to know the highest grade of ahadith and all the sunan and sahih? Bukhari and Muslim. You want to know how to govern? Study a nisai Okay? And Ibn Majah is more like a Musnad than anything else. You want to know how the people of Medina? Then you look at Al-Muwatta of Imam and Malik. You know? And so on and so on and so on. This is the, the style. So here, Abu Razin, عنه, he said that a man said to, to the Messenger of Allah, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I hear Allah saying, and there's a beautiful statement here that we can say, I hear Allah saying, Asma'ullaha Yaqul. I hear Allah saying, and he's saying in the present tense, At-talaqu marratan fa'ayna thalith. Where is the third one? He said, Wa-tasrihu bi-ihsan. He says, so talaq is twice. The third one is when you let them go in a beautiful way. Tasrihu bi-ihsan. We misunderstand how divorce is supposed to be done. In this hadith, or not just this hadith, in this ayah, we learn that the way a woman is supposed to be divorced is not supposed to be World War III. It's not supposed to be a civil war in there. It's not supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be a tasrihu bi ihsan. You let them go in an excellent, in a beautiful manner. Just like you spent money to get married and to pay for that walima and to give her a dowry and to set up the house. Well, you got to do the same thing to let her go. You should spend money to help her get on her way and continue with her life. That's letting her go in a beautiful way. However that may be laid out, the circumstances that differ to the circumstances of the divorce and the people involved. So it's not set in stone how that should be. But the general language shows that whatever and however it's done, it should be done in a beautiful and most excellent fashion. And that's the third divorce. And Abdul number 15, and then we'll stop here. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu qal, habas al-mushrikoon rasulallah sallallahu alayhi wa sallama an salat al-asri. On the authority of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him. He said, the mushrikun, the people who practice shirk, they habasa, they, 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 they kept the prophet busy. They prevented him. A habs is a cork that you put in a bottle. That's habasa, okay? And it's also one of the meanings of the word sabr, okay? Because you also call a cork a sabr. They prevent it. So Habas as someone is like to refrain them, to restrain them. So the Kufar here, they 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 re refrained the Prophet. They kept him from, from offering Salatul Asr. Hatta Hamarrat is Shams. I was until the sky, the sun turned red or yellow. It's almost Maghrib, right? فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. So when the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم noticed this, he said, شَغَلُونَا عَنِ الصَّلَاةِ الْوُسْطَى They have busied us away from Salatil الْوُسْطَى 
So here, this particular hadith is teaching us the ayah hafidhu ala salawati wa salatil wusta. Okay? It says, preserve all your salah and particularly watch after Salatul Wusta. And it doesn't tell you in the Quran which one is Salatul Wusta. So there's difference of opinion of which one it is. Some people who are not privy to this hadith or other hadith that point to that Salatul Wusta is Salatul Asr, the middle Salah, okay? And why shouldn't it be the middle Salah? Okay, because it exactly is Maghrib, Isha, Fajr, and Dhuhr. So literally it is the middle salah. Okay. And the time for it is the shortest. As that time of day, no matter how long it may be in actuality, is a time of day that people traditionally get off work and start to go home or finish off some things they have to do before they go home. So they call it rush hour. Or in Arabic, we call it squeezing time. Asa, that's why the time is called the squeezing time. Why? Because you have to squeeze everything in before the day ends, figuratively and literally. So it tells us don't forget this particular salah. Okay. And there's a unique thing about salat al asa that many people don't pay attention to because they learn salah and then they forget to keep studying salah. Salat al asa, it is recommended, meaning mustahab to move a little bit quicker in your movements in Salat al-Asr, unlike the other salawat. Go back and look at that. Look for what I've said and you'll find the language that explains how to offer Salat al-Asr different. Not saying you, you don't recite properly. I'm saying the movements are, are, are recommended to move quicker. Why? Because it's squeezing it in and Allah knows best. Don't believe me. Go look it up. So he says, they busied us away from Salatul Wusta, Salatul Asri. Mala Allahu ajwafahum wa qaburahum nara. So he cursed them. He cursed them. This is another be a benefit of this hadith is to teach us that you can curse the kuffar. We have so many sissy Muslims out there these days. Don't curse the kuffar. What's wrong with you? Where's the manhood in that? Where's the understanding? Don't curse them. Allah's messenger cursed them. And we have the proof here. This hadith, akhrajahu Muslim. It is now, it is compiled by Imam Muslim. So it's the second highest level of authenticity. And it has the highest level of authenticity of the language. Because Bukhari wrote all his hadith from memory. Where Muslim had a servant and he was living in his home, in his library. And he wrote all the hadith out after looking at his notes. So you'll find the scholars of hadith bringing the language of Muslim and preferring the language of the organization of Imam Muslim because his was followed up with looking. Even though Bukhari, his is the most authentic, but he went off his memory. Okay? So here, the language is clear. The Messenger of Allah cursed them. He said, may Allah fill their insides and their graves with fire. Mala Allahu ajwafahum wa qaburahum nara. So you can actually make this same curse on them, or in general, it shows you can curse the kuffar when they have done something like this. Awqal, or he said, Hash Allahu ajwafahum wa qaburahum nara, meaning may Allah fill their, their insides and their graves with fire. Akhrajahum Muslim. Well, I will do one more because I don't want to stop on that particular hadith. Number 16. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, again from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, and he was a, one of the Sahaba who was considered a mufassir, a sheikh, a scholar amongst the Sahaba. Qala, he said, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna li shaytani lammatan bibni adam. وَلِلْمَلَكِ لَمَّةِ فَأَمَّا لَمَّةُ الشَّيْطَانِ فَعِعَادٌ بِالشَّرْ وَتَكْذِيبٌ بِالْحَقِّ So he says here, Shaytan, the fact of the matter is, for Shaytan, he has a, a lemma. He has something he constantly does. Lemma is, is to emphasize something. 
Okay, something he emphasis on for Ibn Adam with the sons of Adam, meaning he has a habit, a technique that he always uses on the sons of Adam. It's a beautiful hadith. It's telling us the style in which shaitan fights us, the style in which shaitan tricks us, the style in which shaitan attacks us. He uses two tricks, Allah's Messenger is telling us. And for the angel has two tricks as well. He says, as for the thing that shaitan does, he does. He's always bringing up evil, going back to evil and mischief. Okay. Right. And he's always lying about the truth. Calling the truth a lie. He's always making the truth look like it's not true. Pay attention to these two things because when you understand this, you can, in general, listen to everything the Kufar are saying and say they are lying. Okay? Takdibun bil They are lying. They went to the moon. They are lying. Okay? Anything they say, takdibun bil Okay? Oh, these guys are terrorists. We're scared of them. They are lying. Everything they're saying. They are bringing the evil and pretending someone else is doing it. And as for the things that the angel does, then he is always whispering and pushing, inspiring people to do khair, good thoughts, good ideas. So one is 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 negative what is the thing the term that they use when you, you give an, an odious tone to a rule you know pessimism and the other one is optimistic shaitan pushes pessimism and the angels push optimism what does and they push the the confirming and the acknowledging the truth reality Constantly pushing and promoting the acceptance and the acknowledgement of truth. Alhamdulillah. So whoever finds that, then let him know that this is from Allah. That he should praise Allah. Alhamdulillah. And so whoever finds the other two, pessimism comes to mind. And some takdhi, don't trust this, don't trust that. Takdhi bil haq. Then let him, let him say, A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Let him seek refuge in Allah from shaytan, the rejected one, the mal'oon, the cursed one. This has been narrated by, I'm sorry, this has been compiled by Imam Al-Tirmidhi. We stop here. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. We stopped on number 16. I'm sorry, I didn't finish the hadith. I stopped for a while. I got distracted. Then he recited the ayah. Ash-shaytan ya'idukum al-faqra wa ya'murukum bil fahsha. Al -ayah. He says, a shaitan, he promises you, he threatens you, he's constantly mentioning to you, faqra, poverty, and he's always commanding and encouraging, bil fahsha, with fahsha. Fahsha is inappropriate activities, nakedness, sacrilegious speech, okay? Inappropriate language, inappropriate dress, inappropriate thoughts, inappropriate looks. Okay, so these two things that he's doing, Ya'idukum bil faqr, constantly trying to scare people that you're going, you don't have enough risk. Because this is what he's saying. He's trying to to make us believe that Allah has not provided for you enough. You're not. And what Allah tells us the first thing He did when He said to Adam was that He said, Adam, mata'um. Right? He said, I'm going to give you all this, this mata'afi dunya. Before he sent Adam in Hawadah, you will live there and you have everything you need. 
So shaitan is telling you, taqdeebun bilhaq. You don't have everything you need. It's not enough. Watch out, you're going to be poor. Be stingy. Don't give sadaqah. You need it. Faqr. Constantly scaring and threatening people. Don't have babies. You can't afford them. It's expensive these days. And you have Muslims saying the same thing. Why is this a lie? Because Allah's messenger told us the angel comes and puts everybody's risk on their neck. Everybody's provision is given to them. How much they're going to need, everything they're going to need until the Yawmul Qiyam. They got to get it. When it's time for them to get it, it's the Qadr of Allah. Children are not expensive. It is a lie. Every child that comes into this earth with his parents, his provisions are given. It may go through the father, it may go through the mother, it may go through the uncle, it may go through somebody else. It's already there. All these are lies of the shaitan and the worshippers of shaitan and those who have accepted the da'wah of shaitan are following. Okay? And we should remember the promise of Allah. Okay? The system Allah has set up. He has not sent us here and not provided for us. Our rizq is provided. Right? And our mata, all the things we need have been given to us. We have nothing to fear. And if you are afraid, Make dua. That's your superpower. Make dua. Believe it. Allah will give it to you. Okay? This is my lesson for today. Let me see if we have some more time to answer some questions. I didn't get a message from Anzumana. So let me see. I don't know what time it is. What time is it? Okay. So I have a few minutes. Chief Hamza, mashallah, wa barakallahu feekum. Mashallah. Mashallah, assalamu alaikum everyone. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Rabbi zidni ilma, ameen. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Everyone, I'm just looking for questions. Hey, my cousins here. Hey, Abdullah, barakallahu feekum. Ubay. Oh. Maridan now. Maridan means sick. Okay. Mashallah, barakallahu feekum, shaykh. Maridan. Ayyub, mashallah, assalamu alaikum, Ayyub. Is about khabar. Okay. Mahid, come on. I'm just looking for questions, okay? Naji person, so I'm like, is practicing hijama cupping while fasting allowed? There is, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, there is difference of opinion with regards to practicing hijama while fasting. The reason for the, the ikhtilaf is because fat, uh, sorry, because hijama is a medical uh, procedure. Alhamdulillah. So sometimes there are going to be people who need this medical procedure during Ramadan or while the person, the Hajim himself, is fasting. In those cases, it is allowed to give the hijama for the person who needs it. Let's say a person got bit by or stung by a scorpion. So they might have a big old hole in there to ask like acid. They need to get hijama, okay? Or some other medical reason that the person needs to get, needs to, is the key word. Other person might say, you know what? I like to get hijama every three months. Or I like to get hijama every month. I like to get hijama every time I'm on my menses, but somebody may have a reason why they want to get hijama. But now it's Ramadan or it's during a time where someone is fasting or they themselves are fasting. This person should not do so. Okay, this person should not do so. Why? Because fasting in and of itself is a medical procedure. Okay. It's something that we are now, people are now just learning from the physical medicinal benefits of fasting. And so Doing these two at the same time may cause some problems for the person who's fasting. So unless there is a clear need to do hijama while the person is fasting, he should not do hijama. As for the person performing the hijama, 
he should be a hajim. Nowadays, hijab has become very widespread. More people are learning how to do that. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, okay? Because when I went to school for hijama, it took us like six months to learn how to do hijama in the school that we had to go through and the things that we had to do. And I, I studied it when I was in Mauritania. Now I see people, they study hijama for a week or two, and I'm literally saying a week or two of a seminar, and they're gearing, doing hijama. They may not know all the things that might happen that the person with some type of you know knowledge of anatomy and biology and hijama itself needs to know. So I would say it's whereas it's a good thing that more people know how to do hijama, I encourage those people who are hijama specialists to learn as much as you can about hijama and anatomy and biology as you're studying this. And don't just go in the short version and study it. I hope that answers your question. Uh, as a hajim, I would not uh, suggest to anybody to give hijama to someone else while they're fasting, unless that person has a clear medical need for that, okay? Some of the reasons are maybe a woman is going in labor, maybe the lady is having a miscarriage, maybe the lady is, uh, what do you call it? Somebody's been injured and hijamas draw the blood, the bad blood out, and these things like that, and Allah knows best. Like salam be shuffle. That uh, Tyler Boyd asks, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Amin, how does taqwa, I'm sorry, how does dua express one's taqwa? What is taqwa? Taqwa is knowing the laws of Allah, right? And acting on them and restraining or doing what Allah has told you to do. That's what ha having taqwa is, okay? So Allah has told you amongst the laws of Allah is what? To turn to him. He's told you to make dua to him. Okay. So this is an expression of your taqwa to Allah. Knowing that there's an option. You can turn to someone else. But turning to Allah alone for all your needs is the meaning of la ilaha illallah. Is the meaning of qul huwallahu ahad allahu somad. Allah is summoned, the one yalja'u ilayhi fil masa'ib, the one that everyone goes to when they have a need, when they have a calamity, you know, they turn to Allah and they ask Allah. So this is the expression of a person's taqwa, another meaning of taqwa is consciousness. What taqwa and remember Allah, right? And give Allah his rights and fear Allah, right? So that's how dua is an expression of taqwa and not making dua to other than or not seeking help from other than Allah is an expression of taqwa. I hope that answers the question or makes the issue clear, I should say. Alhamdulillah. How can one person maintain their cool, meet their composure during their, the fasting. The person, alhamdulillah, this is a beautiful question. I, I remember that people do get short, have sometimes have a short temper when they're fasting. This can, this can happen, it's not unusual. A person should know himself though, okay? A person should, when I say a person, I'm talking about a Muslim, should be reflective and consider who am I? What is my nature? Not what other people say. What do I know about myself? Let me believe myself about what I say about myself. Self, are you short-tempered? Self, are you feeling uncomfortable? If I am feeling uncomfortable, why is that? Can I do something to stop that? Meaning, can I go to bed early? Because a lot of times people are uncomfortable during the Ramadan fast and it's their fault, okay? It's their fault. Why is it their fault? Because they've turned Ramadan fast into a festival. And they're up half the night, jaw jacking, eating, hanging out, and partying with their Muslim brothers and sisters when they should be at home, in bed, getting some well-needed rest, okay? Getting the rest they need, drinking some water, so they can be well liquidated and not so tired the next day, okay? 
so they can get up and have a nice suhoor. So we're getting well rested, getting a nice small suhoor in the morning time, right? Starting your day and then breaking your fast as soon as possible, praying and going home again, getting some rest, not talking so much. This will help you not get so angry, okay? This will help you from not being short-tempered, I should say, not angry, short-tempered, because short temper is not necessarily anger. It's just short-fused. Second, are you reading enough Qur'an? Because if you're reading Qur'an and studying it throughout the day, it's harder to be angry and short-tempered when you just read some Qur'an. Okay, so include that in your, in your thing. Then situation awareness and adaptability. Okay, where am I? Why am I getting upset? Do I need to be extra sensitive here because it's a crowded place? I should be mindful that people are going to push me and might bump into me. And if I don't want that to happen today, maybe I shouldn't go in there. Okay, and if I am, I need to tighten up so that I can deal with that and not fly off the handle. So I believe the first thing a person should do is look inwardly, what can I do to avoid this anger issue, to avoid this short-temperedness and you know, start there and then look at the natija. What is the result? If I fly off the handle and you know, do something here, what's the result here? How does that work out? And then work it through, you know, work it through in your imagination. You know, if you don't like the end or how that's going to end up, don't do it. Stay out of that. Okay. So may Allah make it easy for us and keep making dua. Dua, dua, dua. That's our taqwa. Again, another example, Mr. Boyd. Taqwa. Make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that you can not harm the people. The Prophet وسلم, said that for a person to prevent himself from harming others is like sadaqa he gives from himself to himself okay let me say it again sadaqa from me to me is for me to prevent my harm from harming other people so alhamdulillah alameen I will not be able to answer the question about the detailed expression of the, ma the name as because I intend to do that hadith to, I'm sorry, I intend to, inshallah ta'ala, give you the tafsir of suratul qul huwallahu ahad. And during that tafsir, we'll go over the word as okay? One thing we can tell you about the word though, just so you don't go home with nothing, it's only mentioned one time in the whole Quran. Okay? It's never mentioned except once in the entire Quran. Okay? So, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. This has been our presentation for today. I hope it has helped you understand the Quran. I hope it has helped you understand fasting better. I hope that it has helped you enjoy your life. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.